Today is May 5th, 2022, and my guest is fine art photographer Jessica Todd Harper. Before starting today's episode, you may want to visit her website, jessicadaughterharper.com, and look at some of her fine art photographs. I want to thank Plantronics for providing the Blackwire 5220 headset. Jessica was a National Portrait Gallery at Win Butcher 2016 prize winner. Probably butchered that name. Her work was included in the 2016 Taylor Wessing Portrait Competition at the National Portrait Gallery in London. And her work will be featured in Kinship, which is a show due to run at the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery from 2022 to 2024. She has published three books of her photographs, Interior Exposure, The Home Stage, and her latest with the title Here. In the introduction to that book, the painter Bo Bartlett writes about Jessica's work, quote, her photographs often capture private moments, most of close family, seeming slices of life which teeter in imbalance and teem with the everyday chaos of life. There is something classically trained about her work, an awareness of the great masters of a mere-like formality, end quote. I would add that Jessica's work has a luminous style that grabs you. Her pictures seem to glow with the intensity of family and connection, but sometimes also with disconnection, which is very appropriate for families. And we'll talk some about that, I hope. Jessica, welcome to Econ Talk. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here. We're going to start with some of the basics of fine art photography, a world that most of us have no familiarity with. Every one of us in 2022 knows, thinks we know something about photography, but we're going to start with what's peculiar in particular about your world. And then we'll go deeper into the art. And I expect along the way, we're going to talk about family. Uh, what's fine art photography? What makes it different? Well, you're right in that everybody has a camera in their pocket these days. So um, there's a ubiquity to uh, family photography in that everybody photographs their family. Um, and everybody's a photographer, but fine art photography seeks to be in the art category. So not just for a casual pleasure or, or to make documents of, uh, you know, family moments or copies of receipts, um, the way that we use our, our phones uh, every day, but it seeks to be something you know, that people might find in a museum, like a, a painting or a sculpture. Is it something that you hope it has a timelessness to it in that sense, unlike my picture of my kid? Yes, I, I often think one of my favorite artists is William Morris, who was part of the arts and crafts movement in England in the 19th century. And he was fond of a Latin expression, um, ars longa vita brevis, which means uh, life is is short, but art is forever. And I think that humanity leans toward a, a yearning for the eternal. And when art works, it references that. It, it's, it's relevant even 500 years later. It's moving um, to people who don't know the artist. I have to ask you a personal question. D do you have a smartphone? Yes. <laughs> do, you, do you take photos with it? I do. Um, Yes, I, I do because I'm a mom and uh, I'm an American and I use it for all kinds of practical purposes as well as just quick snapshots. But I bring out my camera um, when I'm in the art mode. Uh, and in my mind, it's it's very clear whether I'm just taking snapshots um, for everyday consumption or if I'm making something for art. So I, I take a lot of pho photographs uh, with my phone. I used to use a mirrorless camera and I take it somewhat seriously, not as seriously as you do, but I, I take it seriously. And a lot of people, you know, think uh, I'm a good photographer or they're lying to me. It could be, could be both. Um, <laughs> but they say nice things about my work, right? Uh, works, words that you've heard. Wow, that's a great picture. Um, but I don't, what I don't tell them is that for me, except for one little thing that we'll, we'll maybe talk about later, most of my art, the artfulness of my photography is uh, a big denominator. You know, I take <laughs> in the digital world, take a lot of pictures. I think I'm pretty good at picking the good ones. Maybe, maybe that that's something of a skill. Um, but that's not, that's not your uh, usual mode. You're, you're not going to take 
hundreds and hundreds of pictures and hope you get a couple of keepers. Is that correct or not correct? A better way yes, to say I, it is, do you compose your pictures in advance or just hope something comes out good and then take it if it does? Yeah, that's a good question. And also thinking more about what you asked before, perhaps a good analogy is a writer. Um, a writer uses email all the time, probably composes many, many emails or even texts every day, but that's not necessarily what he's going to put into his novel, right? So as a photographer, I use imagery um, every day, but but when I'm composing for fine art purposes, it's with a different mindset. Um, yes, I... So I try to be very precise. I don't take, I don't take hundreds and hundreds of pictures. And in part, I think it's because I grew up in the film era when that would have been very expensive and you had to train your eye to be very precise and careful. My early teachers were always emphasizing to compose the picture uh, beforehand, shoot full frame, which means you don't plan on cropping it afterward. Um, and you had to be very precise because you only had, depending on what kind of camera you're using, you know, the really good medium format cameras, you had 12 shots to get it right. So um, with that background, uh, I, I don't shoot a ton. That said, <laughs> the pictures that the public consumes um, are the best ones. And there are many bad ones that nobody <laughs> sees. And so there is, there is that also. Again, even an amateur photographer learns that sometimes the light is only the way you want it to be for 30 seconds. You have a very short window to get a particular scene the way you you might want. And sometimes you miss it and nothing comes out, right? Uh, right. Yes. Perhaps I should give an example. So the cover of the book is a picture of me with my infant son. And I noticed the light in my bedroom was really good at 2.30 in the afternoon in January. There's not a lot of light in the winter. I, I live in outside of Philadelphia. And so I, I tried to kind of get together uh, this picture in time for the light, but it was gone within 15 minutes. And so I knew that I had to plan for this picture to happen, which is fairly typical. Um, and so I looked at the weather forecast. I saw it was going to rain the next couple of days, but I was going to get ready. And so by the third day, I had my camera on a tripod and I had the framing set up. So I knew what was going to be in the picture and what was not going to be in the picture. And um, I was very cognizant about the edges in particular. So I remember removing some um, diaper trash bags uh, and um, you know, various debris that wasn't going to contribute to the, the picture in a positive way. And um, I also made sure to have the nursing schedule set so that he would be fed and awake during that 15 minutes. I made sure to wash my hair. Um, I, I, I had the curtains set in just the right way so that then when the moment came, I was ready and I was able to make maybe seven or eight exposures before he started fussing and the moment had passed. Um, that's another question you probably would have is, I set the camera on a tripod yeah, was, with a timer. Yeah, yeah it's an automatic timer. <laughs> yeah, a lot of a lot of artists will use um, will use a remote. You're right. I never I never got into that. So I I set the the camera on it on um, on a timer and I jump into the picture and um, and and I'm lucky when it works and uh, and those are the only ones that you know the audience gets to see. <laughs> so let's talk about mindset. Um, you said my mindset when I'm taking a photo like that's very different than when I'm, say, taking a quick snapshot on my phone. Could you describe that? What do you? Th what's different about the mindset? Well, again, um, referencing that William Morris quote, I think there's there's something um, there's something eternal, ideally, in a well executed piece of art and um and when i'm trying to when i'm trying to create something of beauty that's going to last beyond me i'm i'm seeking to reference some of those eternal um themes of what it is to be human and for me i i choose to work within the family um i use my own family and um and, 
and uh, several other families also uh, feature in my, my latest book. So over the last seven or eight years, you can see these, these families develop. And in, I think in part, it's because I grew up in a, a family that was very interested in, in stories. My grandmother would tell stories of ancestors from you know, five or six generations ago. Um, my mother was a big storyteller and my grandfather was a big storyteller. And I was very, always very interested in, in the way that narrative shaped um, the way that we perceived reality. It's, it's a easy entry point. I mean, back to the Odyssey and forward, humans love storytelling as a way to understand their own, um, their own existence. And for me, relationships are uh, particularly attractive. I, this became more interesting or, or more obvious to me during the pandemic when so many of those relationships were, um, were, were cut out of Far weren't able to see um, so many people that you know all of us uh, all of us were not able to see so many people that we really yearn to see and, and not only individuals like elderly grandparents or um, or parents that you were trying to stay away from but just casual interactions in the grocery store or walking your kids to school and all those acquaintances that make up the fabric of life and I found I was uh, really reminded of. Um, in Genesis, uh, before Genesis 3, so before the fall, um, in that story, uh, most people are, are familiar with, um, you know, on the first day, you know, God, God created the um, God created light, right? Let there be light is the, the first thing that God creates. And then he goes on so forth. He creates the animals, the plants, the sea, the, the sky, the heavens, um, everything. And everything God creates, he says afterward, and it was good right? And um, the only thing that wasn't good in all of creation and that whole narrative is when after he creates Adam, he says it is not good for Adam to be alone. And, and so he creates Eve. And I found myself thinking about that text a lot. It is not good for man to be alone. And, um, and during the pandemic, I think we really felt that acutely. It wasn't good for us to be isolated, to be alone. And in my work, I am really interested in in those relationships that bind us and um, that we navigate through the course of our everyday lives which you know which is your family and um, you know from from the dawn of time human beings have been living in, in families and um, how does that how does that shape how we navigate our lives, how we see ourselves, um, how we construct meaning. And so when I'm making pictures of my family, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to interface with those issues. How, how are we constructing meaning um, in an eternal sense? So I think anybody looks at your photographs for more than 30 seconds, sees a handful of them. Uh, and, and the more pages you turn, the more it becomes apparent that one of the things that's distinctive about your work is the look in the eyes of the people you're photographing. Um, you take a lot of photographs of your, of your sister. She has an incredible gaze, at least in your photographs. I don't know what mm. she's like day to day. <laughs> you have a very strong gaze. Your children have very strong gazes. And to start with, when you, and strong's not just the right word, they're, they're, you know, it's a cliche, eyes are the window to the soul. There, there, there's something uh, both riveting and disarming and um, vulnerable about a lot of the gazes of, of your family members that you capture. So my first question is a little bit um, a little bit personal. When you jump into that frame as the mother of that infant that's on the cover of your new book, You've you've set up this. You've done a bunch of logistics. You've made sure this is it's framed the right way you want. You've set the timer. You've cleared out the clutter. You put some back in because it makes it look homier. You've <laughs> got it the way you want. Your child's there. Your child's young. Your child doesn't take instruction. <laughs> but you're telling yourself something when you climb back into the frame. Literally, the bed frame, as it turns out, in this mm -hmm. particular shot. Other pictures, it's a different. It's just the photographs frame. What are you thinking as you prepare yourself for that shot? What's your head 
saying? Well, what are you saying to yourself? I think there's something about motherhood that um, reminds you of of man's ability to be to experience the transcendent. Um, having a child is is much bigger than yourself. It's it's awe inspiring, and when you're so you're so close to the advent of that life. And so, you know, this is an infant baby. You're, you're daily reminded of that miracle, but at the same time, you're dealing with lack of sleep and um, lots of diapers and crying. And, um, and in, you know, in my case, other children who need you too, there's a lot of very mundane concerns. And so isn't that what it is to be alive? Right. So ideally we, we remember, our eternal selves, our immortal selves, the, the, the part that can be much bigger than, than ourselves. But we also are rooted in the quotidian. We have daily concerns that need attention. We can't just be thinking about beautiful abstract thoughts all the time or our children would starve. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this duality. Um, I think it's, it's, isn't it St. Augustine talks about the city of God and the city of man, this, this idea that you have to um, navigate both. And so I think when I'm, when I was making that picture, both of those themes are swirling around in my head and I'm, I'm reaching out to this baby and, and it's, there's a sense of, of the miraculous. Um, but there's, there's also, um, it's rooted in the real world. And this is a real you know, bedroom. It's not exactly a, a Madonna and child picture. It's not completely perfect and idealized. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, a mother who's tired and a baby who is, is living his, you know, his limbs are moving during that picture. Um, and like real children, you know, like children who are older, uh, he can only take so much before the photo session is over. So <laughs> I'm also trying to be as precise and efficient as possible, which is something I've gotten much better at ever since I became a mother, because you you lose the veracity of the moment if you take too long, um, as any parent who's taken a child shopping for shoes or, or anything would know you only have a limited time and then they're done. (laughs) So if you were taking a photograph of me with, with my child, would you ask me to think about those things? Did you deliberately think about those things the way, the way an actress would in a role, right? An actress or an actor tries sure. to put their head in a certain place. Is that, would you, would you say that's what you're doing as you lay de- back down in that bed? Yes, I, there's definitely a degree of, of acting that's taking place um, because I'm trying to create a, a moment um, which couldn't have been just captured secretly since I'm also the artist. Um, if I'm photographing you, so sometimes people will see my work and they hire me to make pictures of their family that looks like the pictures I take of, of my family or the other families, you know, in my book. And so what I do in that case is I try to um, plan ahead as much as possible. I, if they're local, I visit their homes. I go through their closets. I look <laughs> at their, their furniture. Um, I ask them, when is the light good in your house? And about I'd say 90% of the time, people don't know when the light is good in their house. <laughs> even, even, even curators who have, you know, yeah. even art world people who have hired me to take pictures of their family don't know, and which is fine. I mean, I, I, there are millions of things that go on every day in my life that I take, pay no attention to at all. Um, my husband will attest to that. I, I can't name any of the cars that our neighbors drive. I don't notice them. I could maybe say the color, but I don't know the make or year. So, um, I'll have them say, I'll have them take pictures with their smartphones and I say, well, when you see light coming through the window, snap a picture and send it to me and you know make sure that the time is is um, is is available so I know what time of day it is and and so we start guessing and then if they're local I I will go and visit during the time that I think is best and then I uh, map out what furniture is going to be included, what outfits are going to be included if I have to change anything on the walls um, which I do sometimes. I remember one time doing a portrait commission um, 
of these this family were, were fine art collectors and uh, I went to go move something on the wall and um, one of the the household staff stopped me because it was a Picasso and she said I wasn't allowed to touch it. So um, I, I try to be, care- to me I try to be careful. Time. Happens to me all the time. Yeah. So, so. Um, but what about, the, but, well, what about the gaze? What about the inner well, so, thought? So then, what do you do? So again, if I'm photographing somebody else's family, it's their family, not mine. Right. So it's going to reflect who they are. And, um, and by spending time with them, I watch them very carefully. And I also, I'm in conversation with them constantly. So I, I, I talk to them and I, I see what, what possibilities there are. And then I try to encourage certain directions. Um, and, and sometimes you just have a very, very limited amount of time. One time I was um, hired to photograph Sheryl Sandberg uh, and I had um, about 10, 15 minutes in her home at 6 a.m. That was the slot I was given. And of, of course, Tough. I couldn't go there beforehand and think <laughs> about her clothes or her furniture or any of that. Um, so I had an assistant I, and we had our lights and we talked about what we imagined would be there and, and what we wanted to do. And um, in the picture that actually run, I mean, she, she's a busy woman, right? <laughs> so I, the picture that actually ran for that, it was a story in a magazine. Um, She's on her laptop, actually, uh, I believe, emailing Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and because that's what she's doing at six in the morning. And um, but the way that the lines were um, with her her fingers and the shape of the chair and the background, it it there was a, um, a synergy that that worked. And so you you do the best uh, with with what you can and every um, every opportunity is a new challenge. It's a new problem to solve. But for someone like Cheryl Sandberg, or if you were to say do a portrait of me or someone else's family, or and we'll come to your own family in a minute, do you tell them to think about certain things in advance of the of the shutter opening and closing? No. Um, people in general, now someone like Cheryl Sandberg is probably very used to being photographed. So I, not much is going to phase her, but, but many, most people aren't. Um, if it's, if it's not my family who is bored, tired of it by now, um, most people, most adults in particular, children can be a little more, um, naive and, and easier to photograph because of that. But most adults are, are worried about things like their hair or, right. you know, do they look fat or, um, you know, do they look old or, or too young or I don't know, whatever they're worried about. And so my job is to make them feel comfortable. It's, it's akin to being a good hostess, a good leader. If, if you're confident and you set the tone that you know what you're doing and that they're in good hands and that they're safe, then they open up to you and then you have to be ready. Yeah, I think well, I would say you know, for me, I, I've I've done I've done a bunch of portraits, right, for fun, and um, I often ask people to think about serious things or important things. I think that they that they know about. But what what you're saying, which I which I've seen, is that a lot of times if you don't do the host comfortable thing with them, you get a photograph that quote doesn't look like them. Mm. You you look at it and you go like, well, that's not them. That's what they think they're supposed to look like when someone takes their picture. Yes. And that's not the same as what they look like, which is a very strange phenomenon. And similarly, um, you can get people who don't photograph well. Um, I wonder if it's because they're hiding. I, I don't know. But I do think people hide. And I think more open people when you say I'm going to take your picture, as opposed to a candid, which is a whole different thing. But when you're taking someone's picture deliberately, um, some people are are going to open their heart and soul and say, "This is me. Take take a bit." And of course, there are other people who don't like to have their picture taken, and I think it's partly because um, they don't want to be seen. And even a bad photograph is somewhat eternal <laughs> in today's world, and they'd rather not be seen. Um, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? I, I think there's there's some truth to that in the same way that people don't like to be stared at. 
Yeah. It, it, you have to create a very comfortable space for people to feel comfortable in, in, in that environment. Um, maybe that's a bit of a solipsism. It, you have to, you have to, uh, to make them feel um, that you're, you're taking care of them and that you won't use this opportunity in a, in a bad way. So let's talk about photography generally. Um, it's a funny art because I think a lot of people think, well, photography's not, that's not an art, right? You didn't think of something like a, a mm. real artist. You didn't, all you did was take a picture what anybody could see. What, what right. do you say to, what do you say to people like that? Sure. Um, so, so photography has, has struggled with those issues a little bit from its beginning. It was invented in 1839, both in France and England at the same time. Um, the English gentleman who invented it was William Henry Fox Talbot. He was part of the aristocracy. And when he presented his work, which he called Pencil of Nature, um, he was talking about it from a scientific point of view. Look, look at the utility of this invention. And he showed how photography could be used to inventory his glassware collection or to make a copy of some of his rare manuscripts. Um, and also he, he did try out uh, a genre scene, kind of like a Dutch painting of a, a broom against a, a door opening. Um, he showed the, how that it could be used to do that too. Uh, and, and so, so then in France, um, Daguerre invents the daguerreotype, which is this kind of silvery, unique image um, that, you know, perhaps people can, you know, if they've ever seen a daguerreotype, it's, you can only see the image if it's angled in a certain way. Otherwise, it kind of looks like a mirror and, and it would be kept in uh, like a little folding book. Um, so you would, you would take it out and look at your loved one and then, you know, put it away again. And he was very savvy commercially. He was, um, before that, he painted, he constructed really big dioramas, these, these scenes that people would pay money for to, to enter and, and see this you know, really interesting scene that he painted. And so he had a, a commercial mindset. And so I think photography from that moment um, has struggled always with, with people thinking, oh, is it a science? Is it there for documenting things? Um, or is it really commercial? And you think of, I don't know, the cheesy wedding photographer or um, getting your portrait done at Sears and like those, you know, cheesy 70s and 80s portrait sessions um, that people like to spoof. So it's, it's always had a commercial and scientific utility to it. But also from the very beginning, artists saw it and experimented with it as an art form. And um, by now, museums take it seriously. It's, it's in major collections and there's a lot of money in, into collecting fine art photography. Um, but for the layperson, uh, I think it's there's still the the mindset that if I can take a picture, um, then the hurdle is crossed. Whereas I know that I can't sculpt like Michelangelo and I certainly can't paint like Da Vinci. That's really obvious to me, <laughs> but I could take a picture, right? I mean, yeah. I, I could take something and it would be there. And maybe um, even a monkey, if given enough opportunities with a camera, could get a really beautiful picture, right? Whereas a monkey is just never going to sculpt David. Um, it's not going to happen. So I think there, there's that hurdle. Um, and then also in America in particular, in our education, we have we have 12 years devoted to how to interpret texts. We call it reading, right? <laughs> so um, we, children are, are, are instructed on how to decode, how to extract meaning from text. Um, they're even given, hopefully, some training into how the author affects the way the text is constructed. So, um, you know, I remember in high school, we had a, a class where we subscribed to all the major publications and we had to write essays about the slant of the author, the, you know, what kind of political slant he had or what 
um, personal biases he had. And and I that was a total revelation to me as a 14 year old. I didn't realize that anyone had any. I, I thought that anything I read in a magazine or a newspaper was like, you know, coming down from God and <laughs> was fact. And so I think most adults understand that writing has is informed by the author, um, at least at some level, right? So photography is the same way. And we don't have any art education. There's no art history in class, in, in schools, in mainstream education. Um, there's no careful instruction on how to read images and how to understand visual language. And so I think it's just a more alien concept for people to look at an image and think, oh, well, the person who created it had a, a huge effect on what I'm seeing, that this is a construction, that it has a particular slant, that it has a particular agenda. But I think that that's the the narrowest part of, of, of say, an artist or a, an author, right? I, I think, I mean, it, let me try poetry. You know, there's thousands of poems that you can't understand the first time, and you learn to understand them through either practice or learning with a an, a, a masterful teacher um, or reading essays about how poems are constructed to get a certain effect. Is that true? I assume you're saying that's true of photography as well, that not just I don't think about the author, I can't even perhaps understand what the author is saying, right? In, in yeah. the case of a photograph, because, you know, as you have alluded to, you know, I've seen I've seen a, a person laying in bed before with a kid. I know what that looks like. Sure. So there's another one. So <laughs> so what's deeper, or better way to say it, I guess, would be what's artistic uh, about a great photograph that is not obvious to a person who hasn't been trained in these in these ideas. I think that's a a really good analogy um, because. I find that to be true of poetry all the time. I usually don't understand it on the first pass. And right. the more the more I hear it and and then if I talk about it with other people also and and they help me to understand it, sure. um, I I get more out of it. So it'd be really easy to say um poetry's boring, I don't understand it or it's just a mass of words, anyone can do it. But the more uh, the more practice I have in being familiar with with reading poems, the the better I understand them. And it's true of classical music too, right? Classical sure. music is something maybe not everybody understands or knows about, or jazz, or um, or even hip hop. You know, any any genre that you're not familiar with at first might just sound um, boring. That's Hell often yeah. the word that comes to mind, right? And yeah, I don't get so, it. That would be yeah, I, I don't get it, um, or it's not very complicated. There's not much there. And so I find um, one of the reasons that I can work quickly or I have a sense of what I want to do when I'm making a photograph is because I've spent um, almost my whole life looking at pictures. My, my mother would drag my sister and I to art museums all throughout our childhood. Um, sometimes, sometimes uh, it was fun and sometimes it, it was boring, right? And um, she would give us crayons or pastels, charcoal to, to copy the works in, in the museums. We, we lived not far from the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, which has a wonderful collection of 19th century works, um, mostly impressionists. And so my childhood heroes were... Uh, Mary Cassatt, John Singer Sargent, um, Renoir. I, I loved, I loved that work. It, it was, you know, it was the late eighties, early nineties too. So there was a certain, I don't know. I, I, I feel like the fashions were leaning towards impressionism anyway. And um, so that, you know, began very early. And then I was an art history major at, at Bryn Mawr um, where I did my undergraduate work and looked at a lot more images then. And just, you know, just as I think of, of Aristotle, who says, um, you are your habits, essentially, right? And so that's why it's important what your education is or who your parents are, because you become what you do. And so um, these images that I've been looking at for years and years and years are just lodged in my brain, and they inform the way that I see things. And so 
when I'm making a picture um, of of somebody lying on a bed, I'm in my head somewhere is probably there's a you know Modigliani of of a woman you know lying on a couch. There's um, uh, Andrew Wyeth. Uh, there's you know, lots of precedents for that. I'm not the first person to engage with that um, material, and and so it's it's in your mind and it informs the way that you see the world. So um, it's you know, especially as I've had children and I've had to work much more quickly, I feel like that is uh, it. You know, that's useful that it's um, that it's in my mind and that I. I have that to at my fingertips. Is there something, let's say in that cover photo that we've been talking about, is there something I wouldn't understand the first time I looked at it maybe if I'm not an if I'm not a skilled observer? So I'm not a skilled observer. You know, I, I was my parents art wasn't part of my childhood. Um my daughter liked to draw and my and my wife and I decided we'd learn how to draw because she liked drawing. And so we bought the book Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain at the suggestion of a colleague and we started mm -hmm. sketching and we got better at drawing very quickly. Never got, I never got very good. My wife is, is much better than I am. But what's amazing about it is when you start drawing, you realize it's not that I don't know how to draw. I, I don't know how to look. I don't know how to oh, see. Yeah, yeah. And because you've studied art, for so long, de deliberately in, in the study of say art history and less deliberately when your mom was exposing you to all kinds of images, um, you see the world differently than, than I see it. And I assume you see that cover photo differently than I see it. Um, what might you see that I don't see? So I, I just brought it up on my, on my phone so I can okay. see it. Um, and it's, it's, and we'll put, a, by the way, we'll try to put a picture yeah. up uh, in the middle of this video for, for people who are watching it on YouTube. But those of you listening at home will have to go to the website and, and see it if, that, if they can. I don't know if it's on your website, but. So I'll, I will put it up. Um, so in figuring out the cover image, um, the editors, the publisher and I were, were trying to see what worked best with the title. So the title is, is here and it references, um, it, it, it's, it, it references paying attention to what's right in front of you. And it was something on my mind, in particular during the pandemic, because all of our worlds became much smaller and, um, and we were called to pay greater attention to what was right in front of us and, yeah. you know, which caused some people maybe to redo their kitchens or um, <laughs> get a dog or, you know, the, a lot of the, yeah. or, or eat a, a lot feeder. of food or, yeah. you know, just all the, the things that people did. And bake I found, more bread. yeah, big for bread. We did Very that. Popular. Um, but as a, I think this is a really common experience as a mother, I found that my attention was was pretty much entirely on my family. So my kids were, you know, having to be homeschooled all of a sudden. And um, my youngest at the time was in third grade. And uh, I found that most of the time, well, we, we go to, our, our kids go to a supposedly screen-free school. So um, navigating the pandemic was complicated, but for the younger kids, there uh, was very limited time on the screen still. and. Um, so I spent, and there weren't any play dates you could go to or, you know, other activities. And so we spent a lot of time together and, um, we read and, and I remember thinking at the time that there was a, um, a sweetness to that, but also a sadness, which permeated everything during the pandemic, that, that sense of being isolated. And, um, and I think in, in this picture uh, on the cover, there is a reference to that intensity of of motherhood, of of being with your child. There's um, an incredible sweetness to it, and there's a tenderness in the way that these two figures are interacting with each other in, in this cover image. Um, but there's also the the color palette, the kind of the cool light. There's 
it references a, a kind of etherealness, but um, there is also a, a slight, uh, I don't know if sadness is, is maybe too powerful, but there's an intensity to their being alone. There, you know, there's nobody else in, in the picture. And that's often the way hours and hours are spent with mothers and new babies. You, there is a, a certain isolation there and chosen um it's beautiful and and wonderful but there's also a, an incredible intensity compounded with lack of sleep and all those other emotions that are going on and so um there's a multiplicity of of feelings going on at the same time in this picture there's also the way that the head of the figure um if you look at, if your eye goes from the head down to the elbow and then across to the baby's head and then the baby's arm gestures back up again, it forms this triangle shape, which is a very classical compositional um, technique. I, I certainly wasn't thinking of it at the time. Here I am on the fly, just uh, <laughs> you know, deconstructing this picture, but I, great. <laughs> but I don't think, I don't think it's an accident. I, you know, there that that triangular composition is is prevalent, um, especially you know, from the Renaissance on. There's also a star. So if you follow the baby's hand, which is pointed upward, which kind of takes you to the mother's face, and then from from there, your eye follows behind her to a star in the window. And I think a star in in Western art references hope. And so there's. Um, it's referencing all the possibilities of the future. A child is a symbol of hope, right? There are so many things that a parent dreams of for that child and hopes for that child. And yet it's mysterious, it's unknown. So that star is, it's very much in the background and it's blurry. It's not in focus. Um, it's it's something that is, is just sketched out. Um, let's see, what else? The, the backlight, so the way that the figures are lit is, is something that I'm very fond of and use a lot. It, it's called backlighting. So it's very complicated to expose correctly. And that was one of the reasons that I adhered to film for so long, because film is able to expose very bright areas and very dark areas um, at the same time. And for a long time, digital photography couldn't do that. You had to choose one or the other. but um, this this is a digital SLR that's taking this picture, and um, and I also I took multiple exposures that I could sew together in Photoshop afterwards, so that you can get um, that detail in the highlight areas. So if you look at the window, there's a kind of mushy gray, blue, yellow um, from the curtains and from the the window panes. So that that information would be lost um, in a straight shot uh, that exposes the face correctly. That would be all white. But I felt like it was really important to have that softness there and um, that backdrop that uh, envelops the, the figures. If it were just bright white, it would your eye would go right to the bright white part and it would miss the figures, which are the most important um, aspects of the picture. But that that backlight is worth it because it helps contribute to this feeling of etherealness. And I think we get that in the Western tradition from the use of the halo. So in medieval art, figures, holy figures, if, if you're meant to pay attention because this is an important moment, this is an important figure, the painter would let you know by putting a, a golden, you know, literally pounding sheets of gold into the canvas around the head. And then um, you start in the in the early Renaissance. It would turn to just a, a you know a very slim little line, and uh, and then they did away with halos altogether. But but not always with backlight. Backlight is still used. Uh, Tintoretto uses it. Um, Rubens. Uh, this this kind of drama that um, that happens when you light a figure that way. It, it makes your eye drawn to that figure to pay attention. Something important is happening there. And so in this picture, um, I, I'm referencing that there's something very important happening here. This, this fundamental eternal moment between a mother and a child um, is holy in a way. It's, it's, 
it's fundamental to all of us. We all originate in, in a moment like this, um, you know, most of the time. So, so the lighting is important in that respect too. Bravo. That was awesome. Um, you know, I, every once in a while on a museum tour, I take a, um, I buy the tour or I download the tour or I put my phone over the image that lets me pull up some description by the curator of, of this. I'm always struck by how bad those are for me, <laughs> the, the casual student of art. They might be good for a serious person, although often I wonder if there's just some noise going on there. But but uh, I think I understood what you're saying there, and I really appreciate that. <laughs> like I hope joke. so. I, I hope like, I made uh, some sense. No, it was fabulous. <laughs> um, let's, um, let's talk about a little bit more about your family's uh, appearances in your in your pictures, and then I want to move to family in the abstract, which you've already started to talk about, and what what you're trying to do with your art in terms of representing a family. But first, so let me just make an observation again for people who haven't seen many of your photos. Um, they're not. Um, it doesn't look like they're posed, of, and I assume they are posed in certain ways. You're telling. You tell your children to stand in certain places. Many of them, by the way, are, have multiple children or multiple children with multiple adults. Uh, some of them are two people like you just described, but many of them are a number of children, some of whom I assume are cousins or friends. Um, they're usually not smiling. They're mm -hmm. usually not looking at each other or at the camera. Sometimes it might be one person looking at the camera, which is a great trick, uh, which forces you, it draws your eye to them. Um, how do you set those up? What do you tell them to do? And what, do they do they play along? I mean, what do they think of this? So um, there's a range. There are a few pictures in the book that are completely unorchestrated. And um, there's a birthday party image, for instance, where I just, made the picture and I didn't tell anyone to do anything, but, but it focuses in on this one girl who's kind of looking elsewhere and has her mind on something else. And, and there are a number of other little girls who are also, their attention is, is located somewhere outside the frame. And so that is a theme that has always interested me, the sense of being together, but alone. So this is a, a birthday party. It's a festive event. The these children are all gathered together. They're in close proximity with each other. But at the end of the day, we're all alone with our own thoughts. It, we're creatures of our minds and even children are as well. That's not something that is usually thought of when photographing children. And that's one of the reasons I issue the smile um, because kids are trained to smile for the camera. And it's a, it's a very public way of engaging the viewer. There are a few smiles in this book. I decided to um, to experiment with that, but they're really hard to pull off because um, because smiling is often uh, less intimate. Um, maybe that's the best way of putting it. And so uh, it's not that it's forbidden. It's just difficult to pull off artistically. And yes, often. Um, there is one child or one adult who is engaging the the viewer's gaze. And Manet did that beautifully. Um, Holbein did that. There's a lot of precedent for that in art history. And what it does is it, it kind of arrests the, the viewer. It's just, it, you're startled into thinking, oh, I'm, I'm part of this. There's a, an intimacy in having the figure look at you that makes you pay attention. And so sometimes in a picture, there'll be a lot going on. Um, compositionally, it could be just that there's a mess of, of objects happening or there are people moving around in the background, but there's this quiet, intimate relationship happening between the viewer and one figure in the frame, um, which is, is intriguing. Um, you know, I'm thinking, uh, Vermeer is another good example of uh, 
there'll be a domestic scene and one of the figures is just looking out at you and you feel drawn in and um, you feel this sense of intimacy, which as human beings, we respond to. You're also kind of, as the viewer, exposed. And it, I, I hadn't really thought about this, but you know, when you have that gaze amidst all the other things that are going on, it doesn't just draw you in. It it calls you. It it says, um, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but it says, I'm looking at you. And yeah. you suddenly, as the viewer, even though you know this is a photograph consciously, yeah. and they're not looking at you, they're not in the <laughs> room, just the photograph, you suddenly feel a bit exposed. You you feel a bit vulnerable and it opens you if it's done if the gaze is is effective, it it opens you up just like the subject of the photos opened up to you. You know, I was thinking when you talk about smiles, um, you know, I always tell people when I take their picture not to smile. I, I always try to take a picture of them not smiling. Um, a friend of mine is a very, very good portrait photographer, says, um, taught me this trick, first one's serious. And usually the great thing about it is that it usually causes people to laugh uh, and, and you yes. get a great candid laugh or, or a smile, which if you say, I'm going to take your picture and they do the the, the, the picture smile, you said um, it's it, something like it lacks intimacy. It's a mask. Our mm-hmm. smiles are often masks. They're the way that we present ourselves to the outside world consciously. Or we think we're doing it consciously because we don't want to be observed. We we, mm-hmm. we throw it up onto the, the screen of our face for others to look at because we don't want them to see our real face. And it could be we're sad and we, we want to hide that so we smile when we don't feel it. It could be I don't want to be observed in my vulnerability so I put the smile on so that you'll see not my real face. And of course, it's it's the it's Pagliacci, it's the 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 clown with the broken heart who has a painted smile on is the even mm. the more um, heartbreaking example. Um, you know, my, I, I often talk about my dad. My dad, I think most people thought he was a jovial man. He smiled a lot. He really was more of a private man. And his mm-hmm. smile was not because he was jovial. It was his mm-hmm. way of hiding from the world. He was a very introspective person, which no one, very few people knew because, oh, he's always so happy and smiling. And it was more complicated than that. But anyway, yeah. um, I, I want to talk, you, you've, this is your third book of, of photographs. You've been taking photographs of your family now for a long time. Um, we see them get older. Uh, we see them growing up. We see their interaction with you and their father and their siblings as they get older. Is there is there a plan there? Is that is that a, is that you can always be taking pictures of your kids? You're going to move on to to something yeah, else. Yeah. So I think because I referenced earlier that when I was a teenager, um, that my heroes were Mary Cassatt and Renoir. These are are artists that uh, that painted. Their families, and Mary Cassatt in particular, painted her own family a lot, and um, and Renoir was very interested in human interactions and um, and and that kind of of uh, electricity between figures. Um, whereas some of the other impressionists are more dealing with the ennui of modern life. Renoir never never goes there, um, and I I think that. I started, I started, I picked, so I I did painting and drawing from the time I was really little. I I always wanted to grow up and be an artist. And when I was 15, uh, my parents sent me to this um, college art program in the, in the summertime, you could take painting and, and do figure drawing. And that was my plan. And when I got there, there was no room in the painting class for some reason. And so they put me in the photography class kind of by accident. And I was really upset because I didn't consider photography art. I was going to be a painter. And um, I, I absolutely fell in love with it instantly. I didn't know anything about photography. And I loved it. So I did figure drawing in the morning. Figure drawing is is when you draw from the model. So it's been this way since the Renaissance. You have a, a nude figure and everybody is around and you draw from it. And sometimes there's a skeleton next to the mo- nude, nude figure so that you see where the bones are located under the flesh and you're trying to get everything right. So I did that in the morning and then I did photography in the afternoon. And 
Um, and that's all I wanted to do then from that point on. So I've been, I've been photographing my family since I was a teenager and I, I decided to go to college. Um, I, I, I guess I'm a, a big believer in the liberal arts tradition. So I wanted to, to get a liberal arts degree at a good liberal arts school. <laughs> I went to Bryn Mawr, I majored in art history and with always with the plan that I would learn the technical things afterward in grad school. So I went to RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, um, which has uh, had a ton of money poured into it from various corporations in upstate New York. So that at that time, which is right, the advent of um, digital technology, it just had every single toy under the sun. And um, I could learn about all of that. And and I thought that would be useful in terms of getting a job too, because most likely um, schools would be interested in, in teachers who could teach this new technology. But I also learned 19th century processes. And um, and actually my first job at Swarthmore College was to teach 19th century um, photographic processes. So, <laughs> so uh, you never know what comes in to be useful. And, um, and so... I, I kept on photographing my family um, all during that time. And so my first book was published before I had kids. Um, it actually came out this, within a couple of months of when my first children were born. I started out with twins, so I had my first children. And, um, and so that works with my grandparents and my parents, my um, aunt, aunt and uncle, uh, my husband and myself. So a lot of pictures of our early marriage. And, um, and some of my friends and their children, there are a couple of pictures of children that appear in that book. And then the next book is called The Home Stage. It's a double entendre. It's that referencing that stage in life when you're anchored to the home. And also when um, the home is a stage on which children learn to live. It's, it's a way that they're socialized. Um, so uh, I, I had three kids and three years. Um, so I was very much anchored to children and the home. And so I made this book about that. And, and then now this third one is still dealing with the same cast of characters. And at this point, um, in the second book, one of my grandparents, there's a picture of him on his deathbed. And in this latest book in here, there's a picture of my grandmother uh, within 24 hours of her dying. And uh, my children are standing at her bed. So there are these incredible life passages that are happening, not just births of children, but but the end of life is referenced too. And um, there are also in in my work there are there's a lot of inclusion of photographs of people from the past and paintings of people from the past. So the 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 past is always referenced. Um, my father is an oncologist and my mother helped start hospice in upstate New York. And my dinner table growing up was, we talked about death and dying all the time. It was just part of life. And so I think that that cycle of life in the sense that um, we're here briefly, but what we leave behind can have an impact is something that informs the work. And what I see ideally is that I'll be a very old lady one day with this really long story of these these characters and like a, a Tolstoy novel or um, um, I mean there are a lot of, of authors who who write these really long narratives of intergenerational stories. Um, that's what I want one day. And so these books are thought of as kind of installments along that path. The, the first three books, they're all the same publisher, the same designer. They can sit on your bookshelf nicely all together. Um, they're the same size. And I, I hope to keep on working on that because it, while it's nice, it's very nice when people appreciate it in my lifetime. And, and I can connect with strangers who feel really moved by the work. It's, I mean, that's an incredible blessing. My final goal is really to have this meaningful body of work for people for long after I'm gone. Um, that's what I would like. You know, one can hope. I want to read a quote from um, the essay that you wrote for your second book, Home Stage, um, which I, qu I quoted part of this in, um, in my book, uh, Wild Problems. Uh, it, it captures uh, what a number of things, but one of the things it captures is what uh, econ talk guest L.A. Paul, the philosopher, 
um, wrote about when she talks about the vampire problem, that there are things you do in life, and I write about this in my book, that change you um, in ways that change what you care about, not just change, you know, the circumstances of your day-to-day -day life, but they change how you experience day-to-day -day life, is how I would describe it. Um, and here's what you're right. You say, the home stage came from the overwhelming sense that when we became parents, Chris and I had entered into an alternate and strange world, a world entirely predicated by our children. I wondered what exactly I had cared about so much before I had them. Time moved differently, too. As one grandmother described it, the days are long, but the years are short. Older people cooed over my children in the grocery store, assuring me I was doing a good job, smiling wistfully at my babies. Once, as I was very pregnant with my third child and my twin toddlers were having a double tantrum and not being able, not being led into the lobster tank with the lobsters at the fish counter, a gray-haired woman touched my arm and without irony said, honey, this is the best stage of your life. End of quote. Um, now, I think, first I want to mention, I think that attitude is very unfashionable these days, a, quote, a world <laughs> predicated entirely by our children, um, entirely predicated by our children. Uh, children are just like, for some, in some cultural ways, I think in 2022, they're, this is too strong, but it's, I'm exaggerating for effect. They're accessories. They're just part of our life. The way we have a hobby like golf or uh, crossword puzzles or whatever it is, they're just something fun. Um, it gives us some all kinds of feelings, mostly good, some not so good, <laughs> maybe mostly not so good in certain <laughs> circumstances. I say in my new book that, you know, as a parent, the number of bad days can easily outnumber the number of good days. Um, so you really don't want to use, I think most of us wouldn't use majority rule for deciding whether to have a child. It's not a utilitarian <laughs> calculus, but many would suggest it should be. Um, but I'm curious... Um, I'm curious whether you agree that this is the best stage of your life. Um, was that woman right? And what does that mean for your art? So um, actually, <laughs> New York Magazine ran a cover story um, that coincided with a book by Jennifer Senior called All Joy and No Fun. And it used my photographs to illustrate the story. Hmm. And her, her point is... Uh, and she describes the story of coming home from work and being really excited to see her toddler. And he kind of explodes into a tantrum upon seeing her and, um, and the place is a mess. And, uh, and, and I think that before I had children, I remember visiting friends with children and thinking, this is a lot of work. It is. And, <laughs> and that's mostly what I saw. And I thought, huh, well, it's kind of fun being able to go out travel, you know, do restaurants, wear high-heeled shoes, wear anything that doesn't have to be washed because, gosh, my friend is covered and spit up all the time. Um, it's, it didn't, it didn't look like fun. And I, I don't, I don't think, I just don't think I got it. It is a and, fun parts of it. Yeah. A lot of it. Some of it is, some of it, some of it is, but most of it's not. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it's not. Yeah. Anyway. But I think, I think that having children is a lot like getting married. And if you look at it in a purely utilitarian opportunity set mind frame, you might say, hmm, if you get married, you're only limited to this one person. And that must be, that must be a kind of en enslavement. That must be um, something that weighs you down. And in fact, I think what many people will tell you who are married is that it's the ultimate liberation. And that's not something that you necessarily understand without having experienced it. And I think that also in the same way that being married helps you to be your best self because you have this witness all the time. So if you're just crabby and impossible, um, it's hard to kind of do that with a with a partner, <laughs> they kind of call you to be your better self. And mm -hmm. so, um, and so it's good for you in a way to be married because it counters against your selfish impulses, which look, that's probably the most strong impulse of man is we want, 
what we want. We want to think about ourselves and our own needs. And yet, if we are left to our own devices to think about our own needs and ourselves, we tend to become miserable. (laughs) So it's society over the years in its wisdom has constructed a lot of institutions which check those impulses. Marriage, I would say, being one of them, it helps you to be less selfish. And parenthood just continues in that same vein. And um, your children don't fundamentally care if you're happy. They don't really care if you get what you want. And they may or may not thank you and for all of the work that you put into it. So it's not really about being praised or, um, or getting your immediate needs gratified. It's, it, it forces you to, to think about somebody else's needs first. And, and I believe fundamentally that makes you happier. It, it, contributes to human flourishing, maybe is the best word, not necessarily happy, but um, allows you to be at your highest capacity um, as a human being, not for all people, but for most people, I think it's not an accident that society has organized um, families to, because we're best in, in that environment. That's not something I understood before I got married or before I had children. I mean, I, in retrospect, I, I wish I had started having children sooner. I, I, I kind of saw it as this, this, uh, I don't know, like everyone has kids. So I guess I'll have some, but it's going to be a lot of work. I don't want to have too many, but now I've decided to have four and I I think it's really great. (laughs) So you change your perspective changes. Yeah. Most of that could have been the introduction of my book. Um, you know, I say happiness is overrated. Um, but I like that all joy, no fun is a good way of, you know, saying that, a lot of things that are not necessarily fun or that make us happy in the day-to-day sense, uh, a lot of those things that don't make us happy give us joy, give us meaning, give us a sense of, of a life well-lived. Um, but, it, you know, it's not for everyone. Family doesn't do that for everyone. Um, no, definitely and, not. And, and, and there are many, there are many parts of, of child raising and, and child rearing and child carrying that are not just not fun, but heartbreaking. and. Um, but I will say, you say that, you know, talking about gratitude and, and um, that experience of, of having a child, uh, one of my children, he and his wife are pregnant with, with a child. And I told a friend about it and he said, oh, they're coming over to your side. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I thought, I, at first I thought, what? <laughs> you know, yeah, I expected to say, oh, you're going to be, a, you're going to be a grandfather, which is a really weird word to use, right? Uh, for me, uh, this is our, would be, will be our, if, if all goes well. And by the time this episode airs, that, that child of God willing will be in the world. But, but I thought, oh, he's going to say, oh, oh, congratulations. You're going to be a grandparent or it'll be interesting to be a grandparent. But what he was observing was that the child that becomes a parent becomes very wise very, very quickly because they learn something that they cannot learn otherwise, which is that, and I remember when we had our first child, it's like, oh my gosh, my parents, they did so much for me. I, I can't believe, yeah. I didn't think, of, it's not like I didn't think about it as much as they did. I never <sighs> thought about it for a second. Yeah. You know, I, I was just talking to my mom um, and she she mentioned how hard it was when I went off to college. And, uh, and I said, I think I said to her when she told me that, I said, I can imagine But I couldn't imagine it then. And not only could I not imagine it, it's not like, again, it's not like I thought, wow, I wonder if my mom's having a hard time now that I'm off at college. I didn't think about it for one second. Not not one second. Yeah. There were hard times for me. Most of the time not. It was great. I was out of school and I loved college and loved my friends and and it was wonderful. And I gave zero time to what my mom was going through or my dad. And um, so my son's coming over to my side. I think it's a... you know, it's an amazing part of, again, I think it's just part of the human experience to whether child raising, having a child or being a parent is, is a good idea or not. One of the things it does is it educates you. It teaches you something about what your parents experienced that you cannot really otherwise uh, tap into. And I've got to quote a friend of mine. This didn't get into the book, unfortunately, into my book, but he, his father told him, um, until you get married and have children, you're an idiot. <laughs> and um, there's some truth to that. 
you, you learn a lot of things when you get married and have children. Um, their costs, maybe it's, again, I can say it's for everybody, but um, it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, that's been my experience, and um, and you're right. It isn't it isn't for everyone. I think there's a reason that so many people do it, but not everyone is called to do it, and yeah. that's why it's good to have diversity in society. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's helped make me less selfish. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that you could say, one could say about your work. Uh, is that it's beautiful. You, you're you're a good-looking family, you know, on, on, on the most superficial sense. But it's not just that. It, you know, it's not just oh boy, she has photogenic children. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you you make them look all the things we talked about in, in the creation of your work and the example you gave earlier of the, the way you use the light, the way you use the the angles of the arm and the the face. The way you use backlighting, um, the way you take advantage of nat- natural light that that comes through a window, um, they create beauty. And in art today, beauty is really out of fashion. Um, art's supposed to be shocking. Um, it's supposed to unnerve you. Uh, and your work does sometimes. I don't mean to suggest that it's just, you know, just beautiful. But beauty itself is... is um, is is rare today in many ways. I think in the art world, it's rare in every world. It's it's rare in, <laughs> in the world. And one of the things I treasure about your work is that it captures some beauty. Um, happens to be the family, but you know sometimes it's it's the snow uh, outside your house or the way the light slants through the window. There are plenty of things that are beautiful besides human beings. Um, do you ever have an urge to make a uglier picture? <laughs> and, and, and and what and what do you what do you um what are you trying to do with that with the beauty so thing? that's a great question and um beauty is is definitely a thorny subject uh today but what's interesting about the history of of beauty um in art is that this isn't the first time that there's been a tension between um valuing things that are beautiful and valuing other other concerns of um justice or truth or um or good you know what is good and so uh i mean two good examples that people might be familiar with is um savonarola who was uh, a very firebrand preacher in italy uh in the late 15th century uh was very concerned about everyone's beautiful objects they had in their in their homes um, and in the churches. And he was concerned that all of this beauty would distract people from, from caring about the poor, caring about God, caring about justice, about what was right. And so his solution was to take all of these beautiful objects and make a g- big giant bonfire. And we know it as the bonfire of the vanities. Um, this was a, a way to get people to stop being distracted by beauty and think more about what was good and what was true. And um, another example is the Sistine Chapel. We would most people would consider that one of the wonders of civilization worth preserving uh, a masterpiece, an object of great beauty, but it's complicated. It always is. Right. So um, the Catholic church financed many of its incredible works of art through uh, various practices that many people had critiques of most notably Martin Luther. So the Sistine Chapel is done in the beginning of the 1500s. Martin Luther is around 1517. And when Charles V sacks Rome, um, a few years after that, there's a lot of German soldiers and they use the Sistine Chapel as a stable. <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's offensive to the modern ear. How could you use the Sistine Chapel as a stable? But they didn't think very kindly on the Catholic Church, the sale of indulgences, et cetera, um, the way that that art was paid for, the way it was created. And so um, 
And you see in the Reformation, this emphasis on, on holy spaces, churches were meant to not have any ornament. They were supposed to be very simple um, because to create beautiful things is uh, requires a concentration of wealth it, it, and entanglements of, entanglements of power, um, lots of, of, of issues that were worthy of, of criticism. And so I think this is something in the history of Western art that we've always struggled with, that there's this tension. If you want to think about the trifecta of the, the beauty of beauty, truth, and goodness, which I refer to in my artist statement in this book, this is what I'm trying to, to reference in my work. And it's, it's those three things are, are thought of over the centuries, many times by many thinkers um, as a way of, of transcending our, our earthly existence as a way of getting in touch with what is, is eternal. Um, so when Kant talks about the sublime, the sublime experience, and you can access this through, through nature, and that's, you know, particularly thought of in the 19th century, late, late 18th century, um, that you can know about eternal things like God and, and goodness through, through nature or through uh, beautiful music or or art, um, but in in that search, um, there's there's always these questions of the more practical and more earthly. Uh, another good example I love is uh, it's this, a story. So one of these you know foundational texts of of our heritage comes from the New Testament when Mary is. Uh, comes to Jesus and with, uses a really expensive bottle of perfume and washes his feet with her hair. And Judas, who's in charge of the money, kind of looks at this in disgust and this like, hello, what are we doing here? We could have sold that perfume and used all that money to feed the poor. What a waste. That's just so stupid. And And I think that any modern mind can be sympathetic to that comment. And I think we've all thought things like that at, at, at times. Um, what is the utility of resources? Um, how do you use those resources? And, uh, and of course, in that story, you know, Judas is the bad guy and Jesus is the good guy. So we know which way this is going. And, and Jesus rebukes him and says, um, and, and says that what Mary has done is, is, of more importance than um, you know, at the moment than anything else that that could be done, and that that act is is an act of beauty. So it's it's informing the reader about what God values, and I think that um, in looking at art or looking at the meaning in life, the best way to know about what is good and what is true is actually to get sorted what is beautiful because if you know what is beautiful then you can define what is good and true um if you like think of the soviet union everybody is fed everybody is housed but it's not an environment of human flourishing um we can we can take care of of material needs in this world at times, um, you know, often it's just a big mess, but we can take care of our material needs, but it's not enough somehow for human flourishing, for what we really need as human beings. And so um, in art these days, I think particularly because we're at this postmodern moment where people can't agree on what is beautiful, then the value in art becomes um, what is most good, what is most true. And in this context, it's, it's, um, it's often viewed in a framework of what is just, what is best for society and for advancing issues of, of justice, of goodness, of what I believe to be good for, for society, for this country. And when you look at art with that lens, um, is this advancing um, justice? Is it advancing goodness um, for for what I believe to be uh, to be good and to be true? Um, you have a much more limited um, availability in in terms of what is of value. What is what is 
uh, you know, of, of justice. Um, I mean, sorry, not justice. What is, what is a value? What is beautiful? Because there, there's so much art that, um, is really nourishing and, uh, and inspiring, which would fail under that metric. Um, how do you look at, uh, a Klimt painting or a Vermeer and, and say, well, how does this advance um, issues of, of how to construct a society in a better way? Um, it, it doesn't really, it's, they're just beautiful. And, um, and I feel like for, for human flourishing to really occur, there has to be room for, to take that risk, um, to take the risk of making art for art's sake, as uh, early 20th century artists would talk about it, um, to make art for beauty's sake and risk that it might it, it might offend someone, you know, like Judas being offended. Um, it might it might not be interesting to people. Um, it might not grab their attention, but it's worth, I would say, worth the risk to try to create images that or objects even, if you want to extend that to other forms of media um, that are beautiful at just for beauty's sake. I guess today has been Jessica Todd Harper. Jessica, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.